God bless you, church. God bless you. Come on, let's take advantage of your standing. If you have your Bible, let's go to the Word of God. We're in Acts, the ninth chapter. And we're going to be beginning at verse 10. Acts, the ninth chapter. Beginning at verse 10, that's in the New Testament. And then we're going to be in the Old Testament. And whoever finds this first gets the first hamburger. How about that? All right, all right. Habakkuk, the second. Who? Habakkuk. <laughs> Habakkuk 2 and 1. Boy, you didn't find it. Your Bible not even open. You know you're supposed to tell the truth in church on Sundays during service anybody in need of a Bible everybody in good shape you have it on your phone your iPad I have our ushers let's hand out a couple Bibles this 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 is this is worth this is worth reading so again our primary text is going to be in Acts the ninth chapter verses 10 through 22 and then we're going to add to the witness out of the Old Testament a very familiar passage of scripture out of the book of Habakkuk uh, the second chapter verses 2 through 4 oh, we may go one, two, four, two. you guys really took me serious on that offer people yelling out I got it or you could do now don't tell anybody this this is an old church trick so please don't tell anyone I told you this they, they might take away my minister's license anytime they would uh, you know anytime they preach the new the gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John anything out of Genesis Exodus you know the average church goer can find but anytime they would pr preach out of stuff out of a book of the Bible and you never heard of it nor did you know how to spell it what we usually do is just turn your Bible to the middle and just stand there and act like you got it <laughs> and when everyone else say amen you say amen say, amen that's right I look, I'm reading it that's what it's <laughs> they in Habakkuk you in Hebrews but the word of the Lord is still good right that's an old church trick y'all don't 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 give that away. That's that's good stuff. I just saved you so many cool points. You could just be in Hebrews. Look, just stay in Genesis. <laughs> the only thing about staying in Genesis, if you got too much thick pages over here, they know you ain't there. <laughs> that's why I say turn to the middle. They you I don't know. They don't know if you got it, if you don't got it, but <laughs> the Lord bless you. Amen, amen. Everybody in? I know we had some folks in the rest of you. We'll allow them to get in. All right, good. Let me get, get down to it so I can get you off your feet here. So Acts uh, 9, beginning at verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias... And he answered and said, Here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and to the children of Israel. 
for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went his way. He found and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like unto scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was water baptized. So when he had received food and was strengthened, Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he began preaching Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. All who heard were amazed. And they said amongst themselves, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this very name all throughout Jerusalem? And has now come here for the purpose so that he might bring those bound to the chief priest. But Saul increased all the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Hey, before we jettison out of there, drop down to verse 31. Let's just tag this in there. Verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And they were multiplied. Amen. Come on, let's go to Habakkuk or just turn to the center of your Bible at any particular book. We won't tell on you. you everybody's got the secret, so you, you good. Very familiar passage. Then the Lord answered me and said these words. He said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Verse 4, behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Amen. I'm just going to pray and then we'll have you take your seats. But I'm going to talk this morning from the subject, the validation of the vision. Amen. The validation of the vision. So we bow our heads in prayer. Our Father and our God, who in days past and in times yet to come, was, is, and forever shall be God, Lord, Savior, Priest, and King. Thank you for being all of these things to us, your people. Thank you for being God sovereign over everything in this world, in this earth, in the heavens, in the stars. God, you're sovereign, you're God. Thank you for being our Savior, the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving us from our sins. Thank you for saving us from being targeted for hell. But now heaven is our home. Thank you for the privilege of being called your sons and your daughters. God, we thank you for being in the world through the person of your Holy Spirit, who even now is convicting us of sin and judgment and of righteousness. God, thank you for being alive in us. And we know you're alive because we can feel you in our hands and in our feet and down in the innermost parts of our bodies. We sense, we know, we have uh, 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 something in us that is toward God. We thank you for placing it down in us. And we thank you for allowing us to hear the gospel message. 
that at the preaching of the gospel something something of, of faith was birthed in us and we don't even know why but we believed the word of God cause that experience to happen again today that as the word of God is preached faith might be stirred up in our souls and that our hearts and our minds and even our bodies would believe the very words of God and though we may not be able to explain, understand, articulate, or even communicate to anyone else, call them to be made real in our own lives. Lord, and cause us to walk by faith and not by sight. This is our prayer, and we ask it now in Jesus' name. All of God's people say amen. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. amen again. You may be seated. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for standing. In the Bible, we find over 100 references to the word vision or visions. Illustrations of some of the biblical prophets and other individuals who received visions from God include Abraham, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, and others. In the New Testament, we also find uh, many examples of persons receiving visions as well, including Zacharias, many of the apostles, Peter, uh, John, and even Paul himself, who was one of the central figures in our text today. There is no doubt that God has used visions in the life of his people in both the Old and New Testaments. And in fact, he continues to use them today when it suits his purposes. Amen? So when we talk about vision, we're going to put this up on the big board. Uh, here is a, uh, a definition or uh, an explanation of a vision. It is an experience in many ways similar to dreams. And it's during, it is through a vision uh, which we receive supernatural insight or an awareness is given by revelation. The purpose of a vision is to give guidance and directions to God's servants and to foretell the future. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start right from the top and say this. Every believer must have a vision from God. Amen? Okay? Every believer must have a vision from God okay now let me lift this up because you notice when I gave you that vision I underlined a particular uh, part of it now when I make that statement every believer needs to have a vision I'm not necessarily talking about a vision like we have here in our text where there is some type of supernatural encounter with God but what I am saying when I, when I refer to a vision is that you, each believer has confessed Jesus' name and has received the Holy Spirit should receive some type of insight or awareness from God via the Holy Spirit. And what that insight or awareness should point to or be related to is to God's unique purpose for you. Amen. Amen? Amen. Is that fair? So again, let me be clear. I'm not saying every every Christian, every believer needs to have a vision like what we're talking about here where we are in some type of trance, some type of physical skate and we see or hear something from God. Now that still happens, okay? But that's not what I'm talking about when I say a vision. When I, when I say a vision, I mean every believer should receive supernatural insight or awareness from God to his or her unique purpose for God. 
Amen. Is that fair? We all we all in line with that, right? Because we understand that what Christ died for us, right, shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. So he gave his life so that we might be saved from death, but in return that we might give our lives back to him, right? And when we give our lives back to Christ, he gives us a specific purpose or assignment, okay? And that's the vision I'm talking about. Okay? Are you with me on that? 2 Timothy 3.16 says this. Very familiar passage. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? Amen? That our job is to study and be uh, a student of the word of God so that as we become aware or get insights to God's unique purpose for us, we are now able to do it. Amen. Right. Amen? Amen. Everybody with me so far? Amen. Going straight down the middle. Now, now let, let, let's lift this thing up because, again, we say vision, churchy word. We're in a church setting. Let me clear about this because I found this to be a, a point of confusion for many people, for many people. So I want to clear this. A vision from God, it's a vision from God, insight, supernatural awareness for your uh, unique assignment, your unique role, your unique, unique purpose, and building up the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Okay? Long, long thing, right? But let me, let me say this. That does not mean that your assignment, role, or purpose has to be played out in a traditional church office or setting. Are you following what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is, your, every, every believer must have a vision from God. You've got to hear from God what He wants you to do. Okay? And, and, and what He wants you to do is not limited to serving in some unique capacity within the church. It may be. It may be. You may be called to be a preacher or a missionary directly related to the body of Christ. But then again, you may not be. You follow what I'm saying? But whatever you're called to do, it will build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? That's how you know it's a vision from God. Right? Because we, we, just individually, we all have visions or aspirations or goals. And many of those, most of those, are oftentimes they benefit who? They benefit us. Right? But a, a, a vision from God benefits the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, so to try to lift that point a little bit. In this story today, we're going to look at Saul and Ananias. Both of these individual experience visions. And both of them have visions directly related to the kingdom of God. I mean, it's, it's, it's just why they directly related, right? You, you can just see it. It's directly related, all right? Ananias is called to lay hands so they can be healed, so they can receive the Holy Spirit. Saul is called to be converted, to be an apostle, and to preach the gospel. Directly related to the body of Christ. Now compare that against these two women of the New Testament, Lois and Eunice. If you read their story, they are the grandmother and mother of Timothy. Now Timothy became a co-worker with Saul, with Paul, and a missionary. He also later became the bishop of the church at Ephesus, directly related to the kingdom of God. But his mother and grandmother, they did not hold any office in the church. They did not have any unique or special role in the church. You follow what I'm saying? But their unique assignment from God was to raise a young man in such a way that God could use him for the building of his son's kingdom. Amen. Do you follow what I'm saying? So another way, uh, uh, Lois and Eunice, they didn't have any church titles. You follow what I'm saying? They never got a church offering. They were simply good members and good standings at the church. 
and their 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 role their assignment was to raise Timothy in such a way that when God needed him for service he was what ready already prepared right so do you follow what I'm saying so I don't want to say everyone needs to have a vision because everyone grows up thinking, oh I have to have a title or a role in the church to serve God that's not necessarily true you may you may become a deacon a minister a missionary you may have a role be usher in a church or something but you may not but you could still be used by God for the building of the kingdom of Jesus Christ Amen. everybody with me on that Amen. and I just I just want to go slow over that because like I said I've encountered so many people who 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 they'll hear a message like this and feel oh I got to become a preacher no you don't the worst thing to be is something you are not. That's the worst thing to be. You make yourself miserable and you make everybody else. You follow what I'm saying? It, it, you're not called to do that. You're not called to be, you're not built to operate in that way. But because uh, someone has not been clear in the explanation, we'll walk away from a message like this thinking, oh, I got to work in the church some kind of way. You follow what I'm saying? And it's not necessarily the case. Everybody good with that? Okay, good. So your, your, your unique role or contribution to the body of Christ may come outside of the church, but it will always what? Benefit the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Everybody with me on that? Good. Okay, good. If you, if you got it, I'm done with it. All right. So we got that point. I just wanted to make that make that clear. Okay. So now let's look at our text. Let's look at this story and get down the road with it. So like I said, in this text, you have two people who have a vision from God. Amen. Supernatural encounter with God. They they hear from God, and so so I just want to let's look at these two visions and so the first thing I want to note about these two visions first here Saul's vision is in verse 12 this this occurs during Ananias's vision from God God tells him about the vision that Saul has had okay and he says in verse 12 he says and in a vision he, meaning Saul, has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So Jesus tells Ananias during his vision, hey, I have given a vision to Saul and it involves you. All right? Now, here's Ananias' vision. Let's look at Ananias. His is in verse 10. He said, uh, and, to, and it says, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, right? Called him by his name. And he said, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. And he said, I want you to go there and find him because... He is praying. Okay? Two visions. One for Saul, one for Ananias. Okay? Now, at this point, let's look concerning both visions. Let's look at the improbability of both visions. Improbability or the unlikeliness, the 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 impossibility would be another way of saying it. And I wanna I'm using these words because I want you to understand that when you receive a vision from God, here it is, if it's not impossible, it is not from God. Okay? Alright, let me say it again. And if you're taking notes, let's get the pens working, right? <laughs> The improbability of a vision. If it is not impossible, it is not from God. Right? Because if it's not impossible, it's what? We don't really need God to what? Accomplish it. You follow what I'm saying? You don't need a vision from God to get up and go to work. What you need is a swift kick. Let the church say. Right? So look, so let's look at the improbability of Saul's vision. He has seen a man named Ananias. 
is going to find him, put his hands on him, and cause him to receive his sight. Watch this. Saul knew Ananias. You know how? You know why? Because, again, when we started this, this whole story back in uh, verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from them to go to the synagogues in Damascus. So again, we worked this out last Sunday. I'm not going to cover old ground. But what Saul did, Saul has started persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem, right? right? And got so full of it and got so uh, committed to it, like I told you last Sunday, went overboard with it. He now goes back and say, look, I not only want to jump on the jokers here in Jerusalem, give me permission to go to Damascus because many of them are fleeing there. Right. right? That's the setup, right? He gets letters. He's, he's on his way to Damascus. Now, if you know anything about Saul, Saul is a learned or highly educated man, right? And so based on that, he's got letters. He's coming now to Damascus in order to what the Bible says he's going to put in chains all of those that confess and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. So here's Saul's plan, right? And I think I can imply this safely without the scripture actually saying. Saul's on his way to Damascus. His first order of business is he's going to do what? He's going to the synagogues. He's going to go to them and show them, look, I have permission from from the sitting high priest to arrest every Christian that I find. They're going to read the letter. They're going to see the seal of the high priest. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to give him authority over the temple police. That's what they're going to do. Remember when they arrested Jesus, initially it was not the Romans who arrested him, but it was the temple police officers who arrested him, right? So that's the first thing he's going to do. Guess what the second thing he's going to do? He's going to begin asking, who are all the pastors in town? Right? Because that's who he's after, right? He wants to get those who are calling on the name. So he's going to say, who are all the leaders? Who are all the pastors? Who are all the people in here that are leading the Christian movement? And guess whose name is going to be on the list? Ananias. Why? Because the text tells Ananias was a devout Jew who believed in Jesus Christ. You follow what I'm saying? So as the Jews fled and came to Damascus, many of them were probably asking, where can we go? Who can we stay with? What church can we go belong to now? We've been run out of Jerusalem. And many of the people in the city would say, hey, go join Ananias' church. Right? So Saul knew Ananias. Right? And he knew him to be one of the leaders of the Christian movement. Right? This is the improbability of Saul's vision. Saul has a vision. In that vision, God said, hey, Ananias is coming to see you. And when God said it, when Jesus said it, I believe he laughed. <laughs> he laughed because he was, though he couldn't, Saul couldn't see. I believe Jesus laughed because he was looking at Saul's face. So, now look, Saul is blind. He can't see anything. He done lost his sight. He's seen the appearance of the risen Savior. He's, he's living in darkness. And even in spite of all of that, I believe when God gave him that vision and said the, word, the name Ananias, I believe Saul's face fell. <laughs> Wait a minute, God. You're going to send the guy, the number one guy, I was coming to get arrest, put in chains, and dragged back off to Jerusalem with his wife and kids. That's the guy you're sending to come get me. How many of you know your God has a sense of humor? He does. He does. Now, 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 you think I'm lying. Watch me prove it. Your, your God's a funny man. He's got a funny bone. Look what this. He said, he's, the God's coming. Now, look what the, the vision says. He's coming, and he's going to put his hands. Now, 
Now I got enough women. Y'all can help me preach that. All right, come on, sisters. What do you what do you tell guys when they start acting quick? Do whatever you want to do, but whatever you do, don't put your It always helps to have women in church. They get that they get the sermon to go. That's ser that sermon get the rocking. Don't because used in that context, it means what? Don't put your hands on me in any type of way to do violence or harm to me. Saul said, now I'm here, I'm blind, I'm helpless. You're going to send the very guy I was going to capture first. You're going to send him here and you're going to tell him to put his hands on me. <laughs> Jesus, that whole thing outside the gate, I'm cool with it. But you sending Ananias here and giving him permission to put his hands on, Lord, this is not funny anymore. But look at this. He comes, he's coming in, he's going to put his hands on you so that you might receive his sight. Here's, here's the thing. Most times when we get a vision from God, we, we can follow it halfway, right? Right? Follow it halfway. But we always keep a little something in our pocket just in case it don't work out the way God say. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? All right, let's, all right everybody take your church hat off. Take, take it off. Take your church hat off. Right? You ever been, you ever been somewhere, invited somewhere, going, you, you, you go, you go, but you're not, and you, but you're not sure, you don't know them, they don't know you, you don't know this neighborhood, and you've never been in their house, so you're going to go, but you usually take a little what? Something with you. You know what I'm saying? I'm not promoting violence, but you get a pen, a, a sharp pencil, you, a rock, yeah, all right, I'm coming, let me, go in first, you go in first, I, just in case something jump off, right? It's cool, I believe in Jesus, I'm covered under the blood, but if the blood don't work, I gotta have a little, I don't need a lot, but... Are you with me? If you got it, say I got it. I want you to see how crazy this vision must have been to Saul. All right, now look at this. Let's look at the, implaus the impossibility of Ananias' vision. Ananias is very straightforward. Ananias had already heard that there was a guy named Saul and listen what the text says of him in the preceding verses that he was wreaking havoc on the church and Ananias had already heard that he had instigated the stoning of Stephen word had already gotten to Damascus now Ananias has already heard that this same Saul after having terrorized Jerusalem, has now set his sight on beloved Damascus. And I believe, I don't know if he did, but I believe this is what I would have done. I would have been, I have, I would have been gun praying that God kill Saul. Now I know you don't pray that way because you love mercy and compassion and all that other type of stuff. But I told you last Sunday, David was a great psalmist, but David was very real in his prayer. David prayed prayers like this, God come get my enemies. God open up the earth and swallow my, anybody ever prayed that? I know you can't say it. Jack, turn the video off, turn the video off. Have any of you ever prayed that kind of prayer? Kill my sister-in-law. I'm going left, I'm going left, I'm going left. You gotta be kidding me. He said, I'm with you. All right, Lord, you got my ticket. What? Go to the street straight. I'm on my way. Find Judas. All right, I know, I think I know who that is. I can find him. Good. Now, what, when I get, what? Saul of Tarsus? You want me to seek out and find Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor and prosecutor of every Christian that calls on your name. Now look, 
Saul had his vision and thought God was crazy. Ananias had his vision and thought God was mad. He said, God, you got to be... God, you know, you, I don't know, I'll leave that alone. He, I mean, he thought God had lost his mind. He said, you got to be, you want me to do what? You want me to pray for who? You got to be kidding. God, don't you know? Isn't it funny when we, when we say that in our prayers to God? God, don't you know? Yeah, I know. I am God. <laughs> I am aware of who he is and what he's doing, why he's coming to Damascus. I, I, I'm aware. But, but anyway, anyway. So look, you got the improbability of the vision. And like I said, if it's not impossible, it can't be God. Now let's move on. Now, now let's look at their response to the vision. They got the vision. Both of them are awestruck. You got to be kidding. This can't, this can't be God, right? Isn't that what you say when you hear something from the Lord when it's crazy? You just say, oh, this can't be God. Why? Because God's not crazy, right? So why would he give me a crazy assignment, right? That's what we say. So let's look at the response. And in the response, verse 11 says, look, he's come and inquired Judas, Saul of Tarsus, and it says, for behold, he is praying. Right? Here it is. If you're taking notes, this is a good note to take down. Whenever you would like to know God's vision, purpose, unique assignment for you, are you ready? Ask him. Right? That's worth that's worth the sermon right there. If you want now watch this. If you want to know my vision for you, do what? Ask me. Right? So you got it. But if you want to know God's vision for you, do what? Ask God. He said, I want you to go get him because Saul is praying. You know what he was praying for? Before the story ends, back in verse 8 and 9, he said, he told God, what am I to do? God said, go, go, go on in. Go to, go to Judas. Go to Judas's house. And he said, there, I'll tell you. And so now he's there, and in his prayer, and guess what he's doing? He's asking God, what am I to do? Right? And then you see the course of the story. God does what? He answers him. Right? Now, if you got that part, then you know the what? The converse is true. That whenever you want to know God's vision, unique assignment, role for you to build up the kingdom of Christ, do what? Do not ask what? Anybody else. Right? And this is the response I expected. Because the overwhelming majority of believers, when they finally get serious and really want to know God's will for them, God's purpose for them, God's plan for them, they often ask somebody else. And I just told you, the only thing you can ask me about you is what I want you to do. You follow what I'm saying? And no matter how you phrase the question, no matter how I answer the question, it'll always be the same. It'll always be my will for you. You'll come to me like, Pastor, I really want to know the will of God. What is my purpose? What does the Lord want me to do? And I'm like, yeah, I know I want to know the purpose of the Lord. Said, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know yet. Let me pray about it. But I tell you what, I sure could use somebody to clean up the backyard. not God's vision for you. Oh, the Lord saved me to keep the backyard clean. I would appreciate you if it would, but that's not God's will. And though you asked me God's will, the best I can do, I can even try to answer it sincerely, but no matter what I say, it'll be my will for you and not God's. Are you, are you clear on that? Yes. And I want to I wanna belabor that point because like I said, many believers do this. Right. They ask the pastor. They ask the ministers, the deacons. They ask their mother. Right? They ask their cousin who's a bishop. Right? Right? They saw a website of an apostle so they, they hit the contact page and they asked the apostle 
what does God want me to do and none of us know do you follow what I'm saying are you are you with me on that do what Paul did Paul didn't know so Paul began asking God right and that what he said he began praying right now look what Ananias does right he's got a vision it sounds crazy his response he does what every believer should not do when they hear from God instead of praying he procrastinates right and his procrastination is a sign of his what his lack of faith in God why because God has just asked him to do something crazy so instead of me being a fool and just jumping out to it I'm gonna like slow down God let's <laughs> let's have another vision <laughs> and talk about this vision <laughs> until we can get some clarity Paul begins to pray but Ananias begins to procrastinate and even starts talking back to God and denying his assignment no <laughs> no that ain't for me Lord <laughs> You remember that old song, It Is For Me? It is for me. Ananias said, Lord, it is not for me. <laughs> I know beyond. He said, look, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you do not want me to go get Saul. I know that ain't your will. Devil, get off me. I rebuke you. I rebuke you. I just, in the name of Jesus, get off of me. Well, that's what he did. Right? Right? So now God answers. And he said, wait a minute now. You, hold on. He answers him. And let me say something about God answers. He did Ananias a favor. You know why? God does not often answer back. So I don't want to set you up and like, oh, if I talk back to God, he'll talk back to me. Not always. I'll tell you something that I've learned about the voice of the Lord. He doesn't speak often. And that's hard for us to believe as human beings because we, as human beings, we're what? We're always talking. Even if it's about nothing, we're talking. Just, 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 just going on. We just, we just program that way. But your God does not talk often and I don't want to create a false image that if you get to hear, uh, hear something from God and you begin to talk back to him I don't want you to walk out of here believing that God is going to explain himself to you now in this unique case he does he talks back to Ananias, and I'm so glad he talked back because he could have hit him with a lightning bolt and say, okay, you're dead. It's your turn. <laughs> Are you going to go get Saul or do I got to hit you down? But how many know God's merciful? Full of mercy, grace, compassion, long suffering to us. Not with a That's old church. I should have got happy over that. All right, but look, get, stay with Are, are we clear on that? I'm making light of it, but it's a serious point. God does not always talk back. Why? Why won't God talk back to me and just explain or, or give me confidence in what he wants me to do? This is where Habakkuk comes in because Habakkuk says, the just shall live by faith. If God has to explain everything to you, Maybe you ought to preach. That's what we want. We want everybody to explain everything, show us how it's going to work, when it's going to work, when I'll get it back. This, that, that, all, all that stuff is great, but none of that requires faith. But when God can remove your sight, do you know what the removing of Saul's sight represented? It represented the humbling of Saul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saul would have never listened to the voice of Jesus had Jesus not humbled him first. I told you he was a learned man, an educated man. He thought much of himself and his religion. So God had to do to him what he often has to do to us and that is what? Humble you. 
and in our humility we will learn that God does not explain himself Amen. right if you got it say I got it. I got it but like I said in this text in our story today he does so what she said but the Lord said to him he said go for Saul is a chosen vessel of mine yes. he's explaining himself to Ananias what Ananias could not see was that in the spiritual economy of God, God had already made an investment or a deposit into Saul's life that he was now ready to get a return on. Ananias couldn't see it because Ananias was working or operating out of what? His flesh. Ananias was going by what he saw and what he heard. And what he heard is that Saul was wreaking havoc on the Jesus believers. What he did not hear is that God had already predestined Saul to bear his name. Do you follow what I'm saying? And guess what? Now I'm going to help you. This, this way you'll share some of your barbecue with me this afternoon. Just like God chose Saul, watch this, and nobody knew it. Guess who else he's chosen? That nobody knows. All of you. He's chosen you. And in some cases, we don't even know that we've been chosen and why don't we know Tyrone because we haven't had a vision from God we haven't heard directly from Christ himself now let me come on right now why haven't we heard the vision from God why haven't we heard it? why haven't we seen it because what we did not we're not praying wait a minute pastor I do pray all right let me clear God won't explain himself but I will you're praying but you're asking God to build, watch this, your kingdom. Listen, look at your, examine your prayer life. Lord, whatever you do, help me to get this job. My God, Lord, you know I need this job. Lord, I'm tired of taking the bus. Touch the loan off. Give me this car. I got to have it. Open the door. Make a way. In the name of Jesus. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Car up here. <laughs> And look what the real saved folk do. And when I get it, I'm going to take Sister Mary to church. <laughs> if you help me get this job, guess what? Then I'm going to start tithing. Yes, yes, oh, yes, I will, Lord. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I'll be the first one. I'll be the f That's what the real spiritual people pray. Now, look, if you examine that prayer, who does that benefit? It benefits the prayer but I told you a vision from God is your unique assignment role of responsibility to build his kingdom so you have to start listening to your prayer life this is why I encourage people to write your prayers out it's a wonderful exercise get your thoughts down but what it allows you to do is over time you can go back and look back at what you've been praying for you can see what God has done right but also you can see what you've been asking for you follow what I'm saying now listen to what I'm saying I'm not saying don't pray for those things what I am saying is what the Bible says which is what seek ye first after you've gone through your wish list the last word on the last line on your paper can't be and your kingdom be built up you got two and a half pages you get up and before you run to the oh lord and your kingdom be built up that ain't gonna do it right take your neighbor and say that ain't gonna do it 
Good, good. So we, so we got it. But he goes, now no, here it is. Here it is. He goes, he tells Ananias, he said, look, get up and go, right? This, this is the danger of God talking back to you. He has a tendency to smack you in the mouth. If you study this text, this go, when you look at it in the original language, it, it shouted at him. It's not, it's go with an exclamation point. Lord, you know Saul, he's killing everybody. Why, how, why do I got to go? Why do I go? He, he basically, uh, good, we African American, let's say how it's really said, right? Let's, 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 let's use God's words in Yabonics. All right? This is what he said. Shut up. Get up and go. Because he belongs to me. Anybody ever heard that in your house? <laughs> I know that's bad parenting. But that's good church though. <laughs> so, because that's what happens if you push God and make him talk back. He looked at Ananias and said, shut up. Get up and go. And while Ananias was walking out the door, God said, because I chose him for myself. <laughs> Come on, help me pay testimony and say, I'm chosen. Watch this. I didn't say you chose me. I didn't say the church chose me. But Christ has chosen me. Look, the Bible said it like this. From the foundations of the world that God has predestined and predetermined those that will receive his grace and be the benefactors of his mercy. Look at somebody and say, I'm chosen by Christ himself. When he died for me, he died because he chose me that I should not die but have life eternal. Look at somebody and say, I'm chosen. You didn't pick me. You looked over me. You said I wasn't good enough. You said I wasn't smart enough. But thanks be to God, he chose me. Thanks be to God, he gave me an assignment. Thanks be to God, I'm chosen. Now look, if you believe you're chosen, take 30 seconds and give God the best praise you got. If you know you've been chosen, come on, give him your best praise. Thank him for choosing you. Thank you for picking me. Thank you for calling my name. I'm chosen, I'm chosen, I'm chosen by God. That's why I'm built this way. That's why I act this way. Because God has chosen me. That's why I praise Him. That's why I bless His name. Because God chose me. Now watch this. I'm chosen, that's cool. God called my name, that's great. I'm the elect of God, chosen, foreknown, predestined, all of that stuff. All of that stuff is good. Watch this. Until the next sentence. Because, now I'm a good pastor. Because I'm gonna give you the real deal. I'm going to give you the real skinny, Jimmy. There's a downside to being chosen. Wait a minute, Pastor. We just we we just did the wop. Wait wait wait. We just we we just we just shouted. We spun around three times in Jesus' name, all because we were chosen. That's right. And you should praise Him for being chosen. But after you finish getting your praise on, do exactly what you're doing now. Sit down. Here it is. Because anyone chosen by God 
for the purpose of the kingdom of his son will suffer persecution right that's not my word that's his word he said in his own word he's out of his own mouth he says as I have suffered in the flesh it was this same Saul who would later write after having heard in the vision that he had been chosen handpicked by God he would write put on the whole armor he, you don't hear Paul praising him you don't hear Paul dancing Paul got up and started writing everybody at the church I can say at the church that put on the whole armor because there's a price to pay for being chosen am I right about it look what look what the text says he said for I will show him watch this another vision not yet given but he, he's telling Ananias in the appointed time I'm going to show him give him another vision how many things he read it in your Bible must suffer for my name's sake Walt is not optional you can't have God choose you and then when it comes to the box are you willing to suffer you check no watch this that question is not even on the application why it is assumed as a part of the job description you've been chosen I'm gonna give you a unique assignment a unique role to play for the building of my son's kingdom and suffering is not an option is that for me Walt? wait a minute that's Jesus calling <laughs> look look Walt had a vision <laughs> Walt getting his vision right now throw your hands up Walt and say here I am Lord speak Lord I will listen to speak Lord I got my phone on vibrate how many glad to see brother Walt back in the service of the Lord Walt didn't know he was going to be a prop in my sermon tell me when you're ready pastor I hit the vibrate I'll, I'll pretend like I heard from the Lord pastor I'll even get slain in the y'all fooling around I'm trying to finish and you're fooling around so look so here it is. I'm come on let's get out of here we, we y'all telling jokes I'm trying to preach so I'm showing many things to myself here it is here it is so you got God gives the vision right now what God also does he gives the validation God validated God proves himself look at verse 17 verse 17 said and Ananias went his way and he entered the house touch your neighbor and said he entered the house and when he entered the house he laid his hands on Saul and he said these words he said brother Saul my real church would have it if you got it say I got it he went to the house laid his hands on Saul and said brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit the verse that you said immediately touch the mind and say immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and Saul received validation of the vision because the vision said there's a man named Ananias coming to see you you don't have to text him I already told him where you are and when he gets there he's gonna lay his hands on you and when he does you're gonna receive back your sight 
And when you do, that's validation that I chose you. It's proof that I called you. It's a sign you belong under God. Let me cut to the chase. We need the validation. Why? Because if God doesn't validate, watch this, we will self-validate. I wish I had a real church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I heard from the Lord, Pastor. This is what he wants me to do, right? You got to remember when Saul heard from the Lord, the Bible said he was in Judah's house three days. You know what three days represented? Waiting period. Now for Saul, look for three days. For you, you or you, it may be three years. It may be three months. It may be three decades. But whatever it is, you got to do what? Wait. The psalmist said what? I waited patiently on the Lord. Now watch this. Watch this. Leave it alone, Brother Charles. Watch this. Look how quiet it is in the church. Because what? No one likes to wait. Three days living in the dark. Three days. Can you help me go to the bathroom? Show me. Where it is. Three days. Can you help me get washed up and dress myself this morning? Because I'm waiting. I don't have my sight yet, but I do have a vision that is coming. I don't know when, don't know how, but I'm waiting on it. If you're here and you're waiting on the Lord, put your hand and say, Lord, I'm waiting. How many people in a waiting period? How many, how, how many for, for how many people in here is the word of God true because you're in a waiting period? I got a vision about it. I already shouted about it. I already danced about it. I am currently praying about it, but I don't have it yet. And I'm in a waiting period. You know what's the worst thing about waiting? You become dependent on other people watch this that's how the body of Christ works the body of Christ is designed for no one to be independent of each other watch this watch this people my generation there are no long rangers in the body of Christ for the Bible says we are all what connected right we are we are all fitly joined together so what I give strengthens you and what you give strengthens me if I, I can't do what I need to do without you doing what you're called to do raise your hand and say I'm waiting Saul got validation right now watch Ananias give his validation but it said me the scales fell from his eyes but he rose and was baptized so when he had received food he was strengthened tell your neighbor I'm ready to eat the barbecue can't get here fast enough I'm ready to eat and then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus come on you got it the same disciples he was going there to destroy watch this here's the validation immediately he began to preach this is Ananias' validation now and he not only preached but he went into the very synagogues of which he was a ruling official and in that synagogue he preached a blasphemous message that the man called Jesus was in fact the son of God he was now preaching the very message for which he was going to 
capture believers, bring them back to Jerusalem in an attempt that they would be murdered just like Stephen. But watch this, here's Ananias' his validation. When Saul began preaching, are you with me? Let me finish, I'm fooling around with it. Here it is, it says, but verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews, proving that this Jesus was in fact the Christ. Amen. Here it is, here it is, Ananias' validation. When Ananias heard Saul preaching, he realized within himself this can only be of Jesus the Christ. He took the chief prosecutor and the chief persecutor has now turned him all the way around and has anointed him to become his chief preacher in Damascus, Jerusalem, and all over the known world. And it served as validation to Ananias that God's vision was true. He said, I didn't call you Ananias. You're not my preacher, but I did call you to lay hands on my preacher. I did call you to pray for my preacher. I did call you Ananias to strengthen him in the Lord. I did call you Ananias to tell the brethren what God has done in the life of Saul. That's your assignment and the validation is when Saul began to preach and Ananias said this must this has to be this gotta be Here it is, I'm finished. 12 o'clock, I gotta go. Jump down to verse 32 and I'm finished. So now it came to pass. Verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, had peace, joy, edified, encouragement, Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Here it is, church. Get this and let's get out of here. Here it is. God provides the vision. God provides the validation. Here it is, Walt. And God provides the victory. That's how you know it's of the Lord. Look what happened to Saul. Saul didn't become a famous preacher like Philip did. In Samaria, everybody knew Philip's name. One of the greatest New Testament revivalists ever recorded. But when Saul preached under the anointing of God, because that's what he was called to do, they tried to kill him. Read it, it's in your text. They were so fearful of the plot. Now listen who was trying to kill him. The very Jews he was sent there to work with. Because his preaching of Christ was so powerful, they now plotted to kill him. And it took the believers at Damascus, watch this, the very ones he was going there to kill, to now take him by night let him down by the side of the gate and the brethren took him back to Jerusalem I told you God's got a sense of humor God send me anywhere 
went back to because if I go back to the if I go back to the Jerusalem what am I going to say to the high priest who gave me officials letters with his seal on it that I could arrest charge any Christian that I found what am I going to say to the brothers my Jewish brethren when I come back here you go here you go I know what I'll do Lord I'll go back to Jerusalem but I won't preach I'll just go for the morning prayer go for the noonday prayer devout Jew I'll go for the evening prayer yeah, I'll bring my tithes my offering but I won't preach this is how you know you've got a call from God on your life even though he may not have wanted to preach read the record he couldn't help but preach when Saul heard the books of the law opened up by the priests the Bible said he began to reason with them wait, wait, wait. But, brother priest could you read that part again I've heard that read all my life could you explain that to the waiting congregation please we give their explanation try to get the people to understand then old Saul would stand up you read it Saul was a small man not of greater physical stature some theologians suspect he had a hump or, or, or a bend in his back you ever seen people like that a, a bent over but but he got up fixed his robes and say might I say a word that scripture you just read it is not of one yet to come but it speaks of one who has already come and they would ask of Saul being a Pharisee elect known of the same who are you referring to he said I am referring to Jesus of Nazareth that's how they knew him they didn't want to call him the Christ they, they loved calling him the Nazarene because to be a Nazarene meant you were nothing he said that very nothing whom you murdered whom you just I was studying this text it said that when he reasoned in Jerusalem the reason why the Jews hated him so he preached the same message that Stephen preached the same Stephen that they all stoned because they hated what he said and what he said was you are murderers you just didn't kill anybody you killed the Christ now Saul comes and preaches the same message and they hated Saul the more in Jerusalem guess what they ran him ahead the brothers had to get him out of Jerusalem but verse 31 says here's the victory Saul got nothing out of it but the church got everything during his reign of terror the people of God couldn't worship freely afraid somebody would hear and tell Saul the people of God the, even though they were Jews began to no longer go to the morning noon and evening prayer for fear if someone heard them praying in the name of Jesus they would lay hands on them chain them even as they did Peter and John and cast them into the Sanhedrin prison church began to shrink back no more revival like it used to have no more great multitudes being saved why because the church had a persecutor named Saul but when God's time was right, he turned Saul's life all the way around. And what was a thorn in the side of the church was removed. And you read it, right? Look at the victory they got. There was great peace, joy, comfort in the Holy Ghost there was edification and encouragement and they were no longer afraid but joyful 
they were no longer scared or hiding but now they were bold and outspoken yeah. all because God had gotten the victory for himself and the victory for Christ came at the expense of Saul for the rest of his known life Saul lived in fear of physical harm mortal danger and even the threat of losing his life and all of that God showed him in a vision but in spite of it look at the victory God gets in Saul's life they can never go any further than what God allowed. Amen. God protected Saul until Saul reasoned in his heart that I finished my course. Right. <laughs> Everything God wanted me to do. Every place he wanted me to go. Right. Every, every person he wanted me. I've been before Felix and Festus. I've been, I've been before King Agrippa. I'm going to see the Roman Emperor. Every, everyone, I, everywhere I needed to go. Everyone I, God wanted me to preach. I finished my course. God's protecting me. He's allowed me to fulfill the vision in my life. And God has gotten the glory. Amen. Why preach this message? Like I started it. If you're here and you've accepted Christ as your personal savior, you need to hear from the Lord. Amen. Not from me, not from your friends, not from your family. You need to hear very clearly and distinctly the voice of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you haven't heard it, take the advice I've given you. Ask him. Pray. Change your prayer life around. Instead of telling him what you want, ask Christ what he wants from you ask him he'll tell you he'll give you a vision a unique assignment a unique role of purpose to play in the building of his kingdom Amen. you may be called to preach you may not be you may be called to minister in and to the body of Christ or you may not be but somehow God is going to use you to benefit and bless his son and when he does, if you'll just trust him, if you just walk long enough with him, yeah. he'll validate it. He'll validate it. He'll send Ananias knocking on your door. And let me tell you who Ananias is. He's who he was and he's the very person you think would not validate, prove, bear witness to what God has spoken to you in the stillness of night. Then after that, get busy. And a night after God got finished, he said, Anna, go, 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 start moving. Start, start living out what I told you. Come on, so the Bible said Saul began to preach immediately. No trial sermon, no preparation, no going before the council, no getting Anani Ananias, listen to my, no, no. The Bible said he immediately went back to the synagogue. And that's what he wants you to do. Church, ask God for the vision for your life. Ask God to validate it, to prove it in your life. Amen. Yes. And then sit back and watch God give you the victory. Yes. Yes. And he will do it. How many believe that he'll do it? Amen. He'll do it. He'll do it. This is the thing you got to remember. And when he does it, it'll be for his Glory. His glory. Amen. 
not yours, not mine, not for the church. So many people are doing things for the church. God will take care of his church. But what are you doing for him? Is there someone he's put you in connection with in your life? A relationship that you have grown to devalue and even become disgusted and have even thought about cutting it off. That's the very relationship. That's Ananias to you. But because you look at it and say it doesn't bless me, it doesn't help me, it doesn't help me get further, it doesn't help me do what I want to do. You delete them out of your phone book. Delete all their texts. And never once did you ask God, should I delete them? God, it can't be them. It can't be him because that's the very guy who hurt me. It can't be her. She's the very one that went to court and lied. No way, God, that you could want me to minister. I'm finished. Let the Holy Spirit speak now. I've said what he's wanted me to say. From here forward, he's going to speak for himself. And like Habakkuk said, when he speaks... He will not lie. Amen. Won't lie. Tune your hearing to God. Amen. Listen for the voice of the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. I'm finished with this. You got it? Ask, pray. Here's something that no one ever taught me to do when pray. When you pray, especially when you're asking of the Lord, especially for His will, after you pray, after you ask, in prayer, Wait. Wait. We pray, either we don't pray enough, or when we do pray, we pray too fast. Oh my, look what time it is. Lord, but, uh, uh, I gotta go. Make time for prayer. And I'll tell you this. If I never say anything else that'll bless you, this will. The better part of praying is not asking, but waiting. That's what he says when he says, I waited. He waited in prayer. He waited in times of solitude, aloneness, quietness, cell phone off, TV off, radio off, just waiting. Pastor, what do, what, what do I do if I wait and he doesn't answer? Get up, wipe your face, go on with the day. You know what you do tomorrow morning? Get back down. Lord, show me your will. Give me your vision for my life and then do what? Wait again. Not pressured because you got to go to work. Not pressured because you got to cook. Not pressured because the kids got No, but I'm just waiting. So wait it. Then God answered. Church, I believe God wants to do something significant in each and every one of your lives. But I don't know what it is. I don't know what he wants to do for you all. I don't know where he wants to take you. Muhammad, I don't know what God's will is for you. I wish I did. I call you, I text you, I email you. I write it on a paper plane and I fly it to the back of the church so you can get it. But your pastor doesn't know. Your cousin and them, they don't know either. Your mom, who's a pastor? She doesn't know. But Christ does. And he's just waiting for you to ask him. He'll tell you. If you walk with him, he'll validate it. If you stay with him, he'll give you the victory in it. He'll prove himself in your life. Shall we all stand?